Welcome, everyone. It's great to see all of your faces. Everyone here from U.S. and Israel, Palestine, and if other places in the world. For uh, uh, I'm Karen Shapiro. I'm the Vice President of Partners for Progressive Israel. For us at Partners, this is the latest installment of Conversations with Israel and Palestine, a series of informational webinars that bring voices from Israel and Palestine to an American audience, providing an important link between progressives in the US and in the Middle East. Partners for Progressive Israel is an American not-for-profit dedicated to the achievement of a durable and just peace between Israel and its neighbors, and believes in the need to ensure civil rights, equality, and social justice for all of Israel's inhabitants. Partners seeks to deepen Americans' understanding of Israel's complexities so that they can better advocate for a progressive Israeli future. Currently, our main focus is preventing Israel's unilateral annexation of occupied territory, and we invite everyone to visit the Stop Annexation Now page on our website for information, as well as upcoming programming. Also, we are in the midst of our Stop Annexation Now matching grant challenge. We invite you to contribute where every donation is matched dollar for dollar. Partners is thrilled to be co-hosting this webinar today, the effects of annexation on communities and families with Combatants for Peace and American Friends of Combatants for Peace. I'm honored to be co-moderating this discussion with the Executive Director of American Friends of Combatants for Peace, Beth Schumann. Beth, you wanna say a few words? Are you sure. there? Um, my name is Beth Schumann. Um, again, I'm the Director of American Friends of Combatants for Peace. Um, Combatants for, and we are the NGO that was created in the United States to help support Combatants for Peace on the ground, um, working in Palestine and in Israel. Um, and I'll tell you a bit about Combatants for Peace, and then I'll turn it over to our two activists. So Combatants for Peace was founded in 2005, um, well, it started in 2005, by a group of former fighters from both sides, former Israeli combat soldiers and officers, alongside former um, Palestinian prisoners. And in 2006, after a year of secret meetings, they agreed to work together nonviolently. Everyone in the movement is fully committed to nonviolence and um, to end the occupation and work for a better future with freedom and equality for both peoples. And today we have Shai and Rafa with us who are going to share a bit about the um, effects of the annexation on their communities where they are living. Back to you, Karen. So, if you just to remind everyone, if you want to, if you have a question, we will be monitoring the chat box. All you need to do is look at the bottom of your monitor for the icon that reads chat, and uh, sometimes you might need to touch your screen or run the mouse over it. Then click on the icon and type in your question. Uh, you are muted, so we'll be asking the questions on your behalf. And um, so as they're talking, if questions come up, please ask them. Without further ado, um, we, who would like to start? Shai, Rafa, which one of you? Why don't you start, Rafa? Okay, thank you, Karen. <laughs> okay, I did not hear you back, but I'll start according to current request. Hi, my name is Rafa Mishmar. I'm a Palestinian. Okay. Well, I was born in Nablus, north of West Bank, and uh, I grew up uh, in a secular family. Uh, my family used to work as accountant, and uh, my mom, um, she studied uh, uh, linguistics and uh, she was not able to work that much she became a mom of five a mother of five, five so she did not work that much um uh, truly um I'm, I'm, I'm telling my story about how an station is uh, affected uh, me directly by my fears in west bank there would be more strong uh, let's say tools 
that the guns, which the settlers are uh, holding it most of the time, will be pointed against us directly without any chances of uh, being uh, under any kind of protection. Annexation is uh, taking more land and strengthening the settlements. And at the same time, it could put us in a position where I would be afraid to travel from a city to city inside this bank itself. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to participate in such a talk. It's my first time with you. But I will talk more according to your questions. And I hope I will be like uh, talking more with the next questions. So is, is it your turn, Shai, in this case? Okay, unmuted now. Yeah. Uh, shalom, marhaba, good evening, good morning, afternoon uh, from Tel Aviv. My name is Shai Goren, um, I'm Israeli and I live in Tel Aviv. I grew up in the district of Jerusalem in the 1990s, uh, which was a very peaceful time in Israel. It was the beginning of the time of uh, the peace movement of Rabin and Arafat at the time of the Oslo Accord. And I recall those days very well growing up in a leftist um, it was leftist secular home in Jerusalem. With the years when I became um, 18 years old, in 2005, I joined the Israeli army. It was after a couple of years of um, the second intifada and riots that took part in Israel and Palestine at the time. And I joined one of the um, combatant units of the IDF. I was in artillery unit for a while. I became a commander and I taught the new soldiers um, their jobs for a while. So that's how I split uh, my task in the Israeli army. I did some of my service in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip, and the rest of it was training the new soldiers. And I think in an interesting way, I, I had a political shift or a change which happened for a lot of Israelis at the time. That were very optimistic in the 1990s, and we looked forward for peace to have time. Then in the early 2000s, I think with the Intifada, Israel started to shift to the right. And I recall when I joined the army how my views have started to change as well. I became more right-wing, serving in Hebron for, uh, as an example. Um, and I remember it was kind of being stuck at the time. For one hand, we had the Palestinians that uh, we were dealing with. On the other hand, we had the settlers. The soldier was stuck in between. And I remember telling to myself that we have to kind of pick a side. Because as a soldier, when you're in that situation, it's a very difficult uh, subject to be. Just a couple of days ago, we had a very, I don't know, crazy, challenging, or whatever incident that happened in Hebron when a group of settlers attacked a Palestinian and an Israeli soldier went to rescue the Palestinian from uh, the attack or the lynch that happened at the time. That got a lot of press cover in Israel. That was just a couple of days ago, but I think it shows um, what happens to the soldiers. They're in a very difficult task uh, to have, and, and those were my years at the time. Anyway, I got off the army in 2008, and um, that was my way of release to start to see things different. And I came back to a lot of views that I had before the army. And at one point, I became a tour guide in, in Israel and in the West Bank, and I started to lead tours. And I found out that I know very little of those things. As most Israelis, we don't visit the West Bank if we don't have to. It's something that we leave to the settlers and Palestinians, kind of their struggle. We don't see it as ours especially not the leftists in the country. And that's how things got to be. Um, I started to lead more political trips and I started to understand what the political reality is just by going to places that I never thought that I will go at the time. Uh, at one point I met Combatants for Peace and we started to tour together. And ever since um, I'm an activist in uh, Combatants, been a year and a half or so, um, we lead uh, demonstrations in Israel and in the West Bank. We do a lot of cooperations, of course, with Palestinian combatants as an Israeli-Palestinian um, organization. And uh, we work a lot in the Jordan Valley as volunteers, escorting the shepherd community, which is something, of course, that we'll talk about today, as the future annexation plan would most likely to start within the Jordan Valley and maybe only afterwards uh, continue to other parts of the country. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Shai. So I wanted to start by asking uh, both you and Rafa how you feel annexation will affect your fam the families and the communities um, at large. 
before we get down into the personal. So, Shai, do you want to start? And then we'll go to Rafa. Sure. Um, maybe allow me to start with what annexation means. As right now, sure. we are not very sure about uh, what does the annexation says. Um, there is no map that we can address as annexation is planned to start on July 1st. And there is not even a single map that we know that would be used. Uh, we have Trump's uh, vision to peace or prosperity. We have a few options that we saw, but none of them is on the table so far. So um, I will share the screen so we can see. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. So just uh, I'm going to start with this image, actually, which is Netanyahu and Trump. You can see uh, on the left, it says, do it right. And it says, uh, no to a Palestinian state. And then it says sovereignty above the do it right here, it says sovereignty, because a lot of Israelis, especially in the right wing, they don't even use the word annexation, right? The image in Israel is something like, if it's ours, then why do we need to annex it? Um, so there is kind of a discussion even about how to call this kind of an um, operation when a lot of people here use something like uh, applying the sovereignty. Um, as activists, I say, would use annexation as the rest of the world but maybe we can just understand where we see things different to begin with. Uh, on that, we have a couple of maps that could be addressed. If you're looking at the one on the left, we're looking at the map of the West Bank, right? That's the current map of the West Bank. It was even many years ago in the Oslo Accord to areas A, B, and C. And here on the right, we can see Trump's vision um, the way it became to be. I'm gonna enlarge it a little bit to help you look. Whatever the elements are in the yellow, in this map that I'm now enlarging, right? They're supposed to be the future Palestinian state, perhaps. And these are 70% of the West Bank, and here we have another 15% of uh, the land of Israel, which will be given or compensated to the Palestinians in case this kind of operation is gonna work. If you're looking at the map, it looks impossible. And I think everybody that has eyes in their heads, they can see that, right? The white part, are going to be a part of the future Israeli state or to be annexed to Israel. So here we see the Jordan Valley, right? All the area from the north part of the Dead Sea that leads to um, this part, they are future to be annexed to Israel as well. And then we're seeing kind of different enclaves, right? 17 of those that Israeli towns will be um, annexed to Israel as well. A very challenging map, I would say, very difficult one and difficult to understand how things would look. One of the options that we have as well is the Jordan Valley only annexation map. Jordan Valley itself is about 22% of the West Bank. And by a lot of experts, we're thinking that the annexation would start here. When I'll enlarge a little bit into uh, this map, here we can see the Jericho, which is the largest Palestinian city in the Jordan Valley, about 30,000 people, will not be annexed to Israel itself, will be kind of an enclave, kind of an island in the middle of Israel. On the rest of it, the blue part, they will be annexed to Israel itself. So added to Israel, another 22% or so. We can see that we have the um, Jewish town, Israeli towns that are in blue, and then we have the Palestinian town that are in green. And a lot of times when we ask the question about annexation, we ask, okay, so who's gonna take the land? Is the land occupied? What's gonna happen with the land? Well, the land is also the home of the people. And if we have about 65,000, 70,000 Palestinians who live in those areas, and perhaps 12,000 Israelis, the real question is what is going to happen to the Palestinians who are living in those communities? The Israelis who are living in those settlements are Israeli citizens so far. They're getting almost everything that Israel is offering. They're getting the right to vote and decide what to do with their life. They're getting freedom of occupation, uh, the freedom of movement. This is all happening as we speak right now. And it doesn't seem like by the morning after annexation, their life would change. The annexation would mean that Israel will now hold by the Israeli law itself. Okay, thank you. No problem. Thank you very much. So, Rafa, how would annexation affect families and communities in the Palestinian communities? First of all, I can simply use the map that uh, Shai used it, that there will be a big shrinking in the land itself. So when you are talking about the, the farming communities, like farmers, they will lose most of their uh, 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 income because they don't have lands anymore to, to work in it. 
And when you are talking about the land too, here you are, we need to mention the shepherds. For example, many shepherds are working in the Bethlehem, Hebron, and in that area too, who's earning their living by that sheep in order to, to, to give uh, the products here. Uh, shepherds are as, uh, considered one of the holy jobs here because Jesus was a shepherd. So uh, this type of communities will be directly affected by the movement itself and by the land itself, it will be military zones and forbidden area to enter it. So when we are talking about other communities like the people who's living in the cities or in the government, like people who's living in, in, in Ramallah, for example, these government, it will lose big parts of its land, but the people themselves, they will be surrounded by gates. That means it will be another kind of ghettos People will live in it while we are in the 2020. So the ghettos, which was like in South Africa, unfortunately it will rebuild itself hardly this time at the year 2020 here in the Holy Land. Something else about movement, with really of movement, the mobility itself for the people to travel to go from place to place it will be facing a lot of obstacles direct more checkpoints, direct more shaking ups, and at the same time, it could be more difficult and it could be more dangerous because in this case, all of the illegal settlements, which is in West Bank, and according to international uh, law, it's illegal, it will become part of the state of Israel, which is an Israeli law, uh, gives the right to hold guns. And these settlers, they are really radicals, really dangerous. So we can't guarantee if we were in a, in a road driving from, let's say, Janine to Calquilia or to Karim to Nablus, the road will be safe enough to drive there. Probably there will be like kind of uh, people who will cut the road, they have guns and they are Israelis, considered us, the people, the locals are not illegally or not allowed to be in that street. So it could be like a direct assassination by them. Unfortunately, annexation means the feeling itself that you are living in an unfair situation. You are not feel you are a normal citizen. Because um, one of the people who lived and hoped and dreamed and worked hard as a peace activist for two state solution. The annexation means no state solution, no one, even one state solution is not existed either no residency like the people in Jerusalem, no rights, and at the same time, it would be for us, the people who have degrees, have good education, they can't represent themselves in front of any kind of law, who will be directly under military law. And it's not easy to live under military law. The question is always goes to, why this annexation? Why Israel is doing this? It makes people more and more in a very narrow small places, very, very small communities, and less jobs, more uh, hard, let's say, more hopeless. And that's not gonna lead to any good uh, resolution, not gonna lead to any good, uh, let's say, uh, results. Simply, it's unfair to have this situation and all the let's say, the hopes of people like us who believe in peace and who believe to have a good neighbor called Israel, have a visa to visit it there, they will have zero dream to have any good, uh, good neighbor to call to because it will be a harder type of occupation besides the occupation which we are living in right now. More children will sleep in, uh, in a demolished uh, houses, beside their demolished houses. There will be no more good schools for them. There will be no more good, uh, 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 good economy for people to recover themselves after Corona. Uh, and people right now, they're really suffering after Corona. Uh, big numbers of unemployment. With this, annexation means more numbers of unemployment, more numbers of losing land, at least for farmers and for people who's having companies to do any kind of importing and exporting by that goods. Uh, more uh, uh, dreams will be really down, will be really dissolved because simple thing is to have a piece of land and to do kind of a small project in it 
and to do your own uh, first step for your own future as a youth here in Palestine. So our dreams would be crushed with this annexation. Thank you, Rafa. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have several questions that have been coming in. So I want I wanted to ask one more myself, and then we'll start uh, with the questions that others are asking. And I wanted to, you to talk a bit more personally how annexation will affect you, Shai, and how annexation will affect you and your family, Rafa, more pers on a personal, uh, in a personal way. And why don't we start this time with you, Rafa, and, and uh, I will unmute you. Um, or maybe you can unmute me there. Wait, I think I just muted you again. And if you could talk personally, that would be great. Okay. Personally, I, I will tell you my personal story with a close friend of mine, for example. He is living in a small village next to Ramallah, and we have a very good relationship with the family. And last month, one of his kids, he was simply uh, able to be kidnapped by one of the settlers, especially the settlers who called themselves the health settlers, who they are already attacking families, who are already attacking uh, farmers, who are already attacking villagers. Our friend Tariq, uh, he was just going with his father and his uh, kids in order to, to, to look to the trees, nothing more, and to prepare the place in order to meet after Ramadan. Ramadan is a fasting month, and they have a good space in their land, and we should supposed to meet there in, uh, in the Eid, which is like celebration after the fasting all the 30 days. And we were so close to, to, to celebrate there the Eid, and to do barbecue party in a Palestinian land, close to Palestinian village. And uh, it was like uh, one of our dreams because it will be the first day of going out from quarantine after 75, of, uh, 75 days of quarantine because of the coronavirus. What was happened that this was happened like two or three days before the Eid. So the preparation for such a celebration was totally cancelled. The father faced a big muscled man with a big tracton. He was trying to kidnap his son with no reason. Tariq, the only thing he did, it, he took his uh, boy and dragged his car directly outside the land, outside the village, and he went to the city of Ramallah itself. And he called uh, one of the relatives in order to tell him I was so hard, he will, my kid will be kidnapped. So this friend, he called. Uh, are you there? Are you there, Rafa? Uh, I don't know what's happening. It's something from your side. Yeah, I don't know what's happening either. There's a. Uh, yeah. Let okay. me. Yeah, I'll Can work on that. Now? You keep talking. You keep talking. Okay. So what was happening? It was like the uh, he called uh, my family member because we have a lawyer and directly this lawyer he, he the attorney talked to the Israeli DCO, Palestinian Israeli DCO, described what was happening, and he asked for protection. The Israeli army and the Israeli police. Thank you. Keep going. Okay, the Israeli police did not offer help or any kind of protection for them. And the only story was that moment, if the kid was kidnapped, what we should do if the Israeli police refused to help us in the situation of kidnapping. They refused to help the Palestinian family while it was no kidnapping situation. So what could happen it will be a kidnapping situation. This is one of the small accidents happened recently, and that gives the authority and the power for the settlers to attack civilians, Palestinian civilians, and they could kidnap the kids, they can burn the families as they did with the, with the Wabsha family, and they could do more than that. The annexation means directly to me more power for unleashed settlers they can attack people in the villages because the settlements are in the top of the mountain 
and Palestinian villages are down at the hill, down at the field. So it will be personally hearing more terrific and terrible, uh, uh, terrifying horrible stories from relatives, from cousins of mine. They could be attacked directly by Israeli settlers who will be totally authorized by this annexation. Thank you. Shai? So Shai, I would jump in here a second. Um, I know that as an Israeli, you are clearly not going to be, um, you don't live in the annexed areas or anything like that, but I know that this probably also um, is very relevant for you, um, especially because you do a lot of work in the Jordan Valley. And I was wondering if you could share a bit about the work that you do there, why it touches you, um, why you go out there, um, and if you could share a bit about that with us. I know you have some photos as well. Sure. Uh, I'll try answering both, if that uh, could work. Um, I got yes. a feedback that you couldn't hear me well. Is this better? Yes. Can you hear, hear me? Okay. Fine. That's yes. Awesome. Great. Anyway, um, for us Israelis, once again, about 450,000 Israelis live in the West Bank, but the rest of us don't. Like the vast majority, 95% of Israelis don't live in the West Bank. And I think many of them mistake to think that annexation is not going to address them personally. Right. If you live in Tel Aviv or Celia or even West Jerusalem, you think that's not going to be a, any change to you. When there's a good line of security experts in Israel, military generals like the former um, head of the Shabak, of the Shin Bet, and of the Mossad, that are talking about what would an station do for us in a negative way, which means pretty much that if things for us are relaxed right now on a security point of view, this might just uh, fire up the entire Middle East in a way that we haven't seen before. And we will do that to get an area that Israel is holding anyway, right now. It's a bargaining chip maybe for a future peace agreement, maybe that would happen or wouldn't happen, but at least that's something that, um, that Israel, the army itself is holding. So what would the change do for us in a positive way? Most of our, even our experts see it as a negative thing. When we're talking about Israel in, um, as a democracy, right? I live in a democracy and I wish that I would continue to live in a democracy. Um, we're talking about a major change. If right now we have the military that's holding the ground, and once again, it will be kind of a future uh, idea of what to do with that, in case the annexation would happen, I'll share with you a couple of pictures of uh, what that would mean. Um, for, the few, for the Palestinian communities that live in those areas, annexation means that they're losing uh, the areas that they're holding right now. Um, there's about 50, 60 uh, communities of shepherds some of them Bedouin and some are non-Bedouin, who live in the Jordan Valley, for example. And even if only the Jordan Valley is to be annexed, then they would be removed from those areas, as Israel is not likely to offer citizenship. Uh, that's a major change for the Palestinian communities, and that is for the future, um, or let's say it can be a continuation of what the settlers have been doing there for a while. Rafa mentioned that before, and she's absolutely right. We can see that the policies that are done by Israel are being chosen by the settlers. They're the leading power in those ideas. And right now they even oppose the annexation because it's not good enough for them. They say 30% of the annexation is not uh, great enough and a future Palestinian uh, country could be uh, problematic. So they oppose it. But what we've experienced for the last couple of years, even without the annexation, is the fact that the settlers, some of them, of course, the extreme ones, not all and not even most, are doing whatever they want and are holding the army to be used against those communities uh, of shepherds that are um, going with their flocks to graze in the Jordan Valley. That means that whenever they want, they can come, they can hassle, they can tackle, they can hit, um, sometimes even abuse the Palestinian communities who live over there in the Jordan Valley. And that's why a group of us, some of us are combatants for peace activists and some others in the Jordan Valley Coalition, that's how it's called, are in over uh, very early in the morning to pretty much accompany and escort the shepherds as they go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Th this is something You're that's been okay. going on. You're okay. You went in and okay. out for me. All right. So this is something that's been going on for the last couple of years, um, okay. that the settlers are doing very difficult life for the Palestinians who live there. But let's say that annexation does happen, which is kind of the dream of, of many settlers, right? They're getting that land fair and square. They're a part of Israel. There's no question about it on the Israeli side. Um, this makes this cousin's country less democratic. The fact that people are living in an area and will not get the right to, to do anything with it, the fact that Israel might even kick out some of communities, 
uh, will be very problematic. And by the way, these are all things that are happening right now as we speak. Out of those 50, 60 communities that I mentioned, some of them, with the pandemic that's been going on for the last couple of months, have already started to pack up their things and go for the fact that we couldn't go. The escorting communities, right, the, the activists who are coming with them, that's one reason, right? cannot come anymore because in the north part of the Jordan Valley, the Palestinian Authority does not allow that. The settlers are feeling that they can do whatever they want in those areas. Once again, I'm talking about very uh, specific and extreme groups who are targeting those Palestinian communities. And it might be that in the time of the annexation, we we'll just won't see those communities living there anymore. That's something that as an Israeli, I'm uh, disagreeing to, um, to allow. I wouldn't want that to be in my country. It can be an occupied territory or territory in dispute or whatever is what I want to call it. But at some point, it will become a part of the country. All the laws will abide there. And then we are in a more serious problem. And those communities that I'll show you their images as we speak uh, will just be moved out, will be kicked out of those areas. Um, and that's something we cannot have. Very good. Thank you. So we have a lot of questions here. Um, and so I'm going to start by uh, asking um, some of these questions. So one let me second. jump in, Karen, as you sort through. Sure. Um, so there's a question just at the very bottom that shepherd communities have been kicked out due to harassment by settlers and soldiers. Um, and I just want to clarify. So the settler community. Uh, so the communities in the Jordan Valley have been systemically kicked out. It's not just during the pandemic, it's not just now. Annexation is only speeding up this process. Um, I think ethnic cleansing is a word that can legitimately be used when one group, um, when one ethnicity systematically kicks out another group of human beings. And that's what's been happening in the Jordan Valley historically for years and years. Um, and people, their homes are demolished, they're attacked, um, and they, they're being pushed out. And so the risk of annexation right now is simply that this is going to be accelerated um, and that families and communities will be losing their homes, will be losing their rights to water. And because they won't be citizens and because they won't be given basic human rights, um, they're not going to have a means of being able to do anything about that. So they still do not, but it's going to be to an even more extreme. So that's just a clarification in terms of, for us, this isn't about, for combatants for peace, this isn't about one state, two state, three state. Um, it's not about um, the end of, it, it, it's, about, it's about human rights, it's about equality, and it's about freedom and justice for all people so that all people can live equally and fairly in the land. So just to, I wanted to jump in and clarify that question a little bit. Sure. So uh, we have a question here from uh, Ayala. Do you see ways in which the cry for justice in the US and around the world could take place and how? So uh, Rafa, do you wanna start? Surely all of, uh, let's say, human rights organizations or movements towards, uh, towards uh, justice, peace, and uh, equality against uh, ethnic cleansing, all of these organizations are considered our backup in the international community. They can do a great job if they keep telling the community and they keep telling the congressmen and they keep telling the people in Europe and all of the people who pay their tax for a good uh, reasons to do the right step right now for stop this uh, uh, unilateral movement and in the same time to stop all of that dictatorship from Netanyahu himself. Unfortunately, he really used this power with the power of uh, radicals, the right uh, wing of, uh, of, of which has existed in Israel, unfortunately, in a very hard way. And it, it's really destroying this the image of democracy and the, destroying the image of humanity even. The, these organizations can simply be in touch with all Palestinians and with Bank 
they can see directly within all of this uh, simple, fast, direct social media tools and can see how much we will suffer as Palestinian community, as uh, people who have the right to exist in their land, but, uh, but unfortunately, they will be treated completely like locals who should be terminated in a very uh, specific places and uh, should be treated less than any normal uh, uh, human rights levels. In the meanwhile, it will be like more dictatorial, more military, more unhuman uh, procedures will be taken against these people. It's the time to, fair, to be fair and to stood for humanity and to stood for fairness. Especially the Palestinians, they are supported by multi-UN uh, resolutions, by multi, uh, uh, a good health and a good wealth from the international community. So please work hard toward this case because it's one of the last points that the Palestinians can really sit fast in it. We have nothing left for us to say we are having a land or having a quiet place called Palestine. It's, it's really uh, vanishing day after day by all of these dictatorial and military procedures that the Israeli government is taking right now. Thank you. Shai? Yeah, um, I, I want to bring up the example of a Palestinian village, a Bedouin village called Khan El Ahmar, which is located on Route 1, just outside of Jerusalem, on the way to, uh, to the Jordan Valley. That uh, village was supposed to be, by uh, many decisions of the Israeli government, was supposed to be removed, was supposed to be uh, relocated in a different position. And there was a big campaign to try to keep it in its place. In that campaign, uh, we had Italian volunteers who came in, we had the uh, internationals, we had leaders of countries, we had Angela Merkel from Germany that put its pressure on Israel in order to make sure that the village would be uh, kept in its place. Because it's very strategic and if it's removed, it will be very difficult to connect between Ramallah, between the northern part of the West, of the West Bank and between Bethlehem and the southern part. Uh, that campaign has worked and that community is still there due to international pressure. And uh, I guess that's the case right now as well. If you want to keep things to happen, we want to keep things in the, the more normal or sane way uh, of happening, I guess that um, Israel itself is not enough. I saw a couple of questions about uh, what would be the future of the Palestinians, would they get a citizenship or not? That's exactly what we're talking about. We don't know, as we didn't see a map, so we don't know what's going to be offered. We don't even know where exactly the annexation is going to be. But all right, let's say it's going to be in the Jordan Valley. Will the Palestinians living there receive citizenship in Israel? Will get at least, let's say, um, a residency in Israel, so couldn't vote in the elections, but they are getting some rights of Israel. It will be difficult to move them. Or are they just subjects in Israel? In a recent poll by um, the Israeli Democracy Institute, has shown that 60% of the Israeli Jews don't want the Palestinians to get the citizenship. Right, only 20% of the Israeli Jews that were asked said that they support the fact that those Palestinians would receive a citizenship. When Netanyahu was asked about it, he said that, you know, there's only three, four Bedouin communities or Palestinian communities who live there, and none of them will receive a citizenship. They will be subject uh, under Israel. These are things that could change due to international pressure. One thing to annex a territory, right? It's a difference to annex people. And that's a question that should be asked. In Area C, that Trump is offering that 50% of that should be annexed to Israel, there are, there's about 100, 150,000 Palestinians who live. Nobody understands what their future is going to be. Uh, some are talking about any kind of uh, status. And Netanyahu, once again, is talking about not giving any. And I guess only in a couple of weeks we would know what is the actual plan and how can we fight it and um, see how we can bring more human rights into the Palestinians in the West Bank. Thank you, Shai. Beth, you had a question? I did, although Shai answered it. It was um, a, a bunch of questions in the chat that were coming in about right. uh, citizenship right. and the fate of the Palestinian community in the West Bank. We got three or four questions about that. Um, but just to chime in about that, I mean, Bibi has been quite clear 
that the communities living in the West Bank, the Palestinian communities, will not be receiving citizenship or equal rights. Um, and what we've seen in, with annexations in the past is um, that has also been the case. When, when East Jerusalem was annexed, um, one of our activists, Suli Khatib, who was on the call yesterday, he was telling the story um, how all his family land was taken, there was, the wall was built, and now his family is not even allowed to visit his own land, that the land was literally just stolen from him. So if we look at um, annexations in the past and what we can learn from what's likely going to happen in this annexation, we can probably say that it is um, not looking good for the people who live on the current the land that is to be annexed. Um, but maybe if um, Rafa and Shai, I see we're close to time, if you have any closing thoughts um, before we wrap up. Oh, yeah. let me unmute Rafa, sorry. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good and unmuted, right? You're unmuted, yeah. Rafa. So. Okay. Can I finish first? Yes, you go first. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, as a, as a closing statement, I can say it's uh, we have the situation of people, the citizens of Jerusalem, and they don't have uh, that much rights there, even they are living under Israeli uh, authority as part of Israel since the 67. And the Palestinian units in Jerusalem, they don't really get that much services. They don't really get that much help as Palestinians lives in Israel. And during coronavirus, that was too obvious. There was not any medical help for them, but they were uh, opposed and uh, uh, should pay the tax. They are known as part of the government. So the Palestinians, especially the friends of mine, because they are journalists, so they are covering the area of Jordan Valley. They are telling me most of these Palestinians who live in Jordan Valley, they are already trying the annexation for more than 10 years, especially with the periods when the Israeli army is doing their trainings there. They ask the people to evacuate their houses. So unfortunately, they've been trained their area for around 10 years by asking them to evacuate their uh, their things, their houses, take their valuable stuff because they will be shooting and it will be live. They will be bombing and it will be live and they are not responsible to help any of the civilians who stay in their houses. So right now it will be a big evacuation for these people to leave their houses, to leave their uh, uh, farms and to leave their history, their memories, their childhood and no place to go to anywhere. Israeli government does not really uh, respect the Palestinians who live inside Israel since the 48th, and until now, they are... Okay, you, you got muted somehow. Hold on, Rafa. Now you're unmuted. Somehow you got muted. Sorry. Keep going. Are you there? So, the, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, so now we can. Some Arab Israelis who live in Israel, they don't have full citizenship with the full rights. So Palestinians do not expect they will be having any rights. So it will be more, more devastation for them. It will be more losing. Uh, Palestinians will be the losers anyway within all of this situation because no rights, no identity, no even right of existence as Palestinians in their lands and farms. Unfortunately, we will be the losers again. And I'm sorry to say that. Thank you, Rafa. Shai? Yeah. Well, you know, a couple of days ago, they interviewed a farmer, Jewish Israeli farmer who lives in the um, in the Jordan Valley, and he asked that question very clear. He asked, "What would my life?" You're be going in and out. Can you, okay. Shai? Yeah. You're. Go yeah. Can you hear me? That's better. Good. Okay. And uh, I mentioned that uh, Israeli farmer who lives in the Jordan Valley, and he asked that question of, "How would my life look any better if the annexation is to happen?" There's less than 4% of the Israelis who really believe 
that the annexation is what the Israeli government should deal with right now. And I think what we're experiencing is just, um, I don't know, an attempt maybe to do a spin by Netanyahu. His trial has started, the pandemic is happening, and they're trying to go to that um, solution, although it's not going to change the life of the Israelis. Just in the couple of days after, or a couple of months maybe, after we had the 1967 war, right, the Six-Day War, there was an ad uh, in Aris newspaper that said the following words that I would like to uh, read to you. And there was a group of um, Jewish Israelis who posted that ad, and they said that our right to defend from annihilation does not give us the right to oppress others, as occupation would draw uh, foreign sovereignty, and foreign sovereignty will draw um, resistance, that resistance will, with, will withdraw oppression, and that oppression will withdraw terror and then count on terror against it. And the victims of terror are usually innocent people. Now, what we experienced in the last 50 something years is exactly that. We saw years and years of struggle between um, Israel and between the Palestinians. We saw terror organizations that are forming up to tackle Israel, and then Israel and going and holding out the occupation. Why are we fueling up this thing? if we know that this is the one thing that, that we don't want to see anymore, if we already agreed that we should live here in a different way, then why are we not trying to get out of it instead of trying to just strengthen in and uh, put ourselves in a position that we could not come out of anymore? And one day people would ask, remember that day that maybe we, we didn't <laughs> we didn't need to annex uh, the areas of the West Bank. Once that happened, uh, that was a non-turning point, or from that point we couldn't go any back. Um, I hope that with the work of the Israeli activists, the Palestinian activists, and of course international pressure, that wouldn't happen. Uh, once again, we're waiting to see what are the plans, and of course we will reject to anything that we see as unjust. Thank you, Shai, and thank you, Rafa. Shai, I totally agree. We've got to do everything in our power to stop this annexation. Any annexation is we can't turn around once it starts. There'll be a precedent and it won't be able to turn around. So thank you everyone on this Zoom meeting for joining us. It's great to see your faces. Uh, I wanna thank Beth for co-moderating this discussion and especially to uh, Rafa and Shai for joining us today and for the important work that you do every day. Also want to thank the staffs of American Friends for Combatants for Peace and Partners for Progressive Israel for their work in making this discussion happen, uh, as well as also uh, Combatants for Peace in Israel. To learn more about Partners for Progressive Israel, our future programs and our Stop Annexation Now campaign, go to progressiveisrael.org. And please contribute to our matching grant challenge. Every dollar you give is worth $2. Thanks and stay safe. Beth, do you wanna say a few words? Sure, thank you so much. Um, so thank you to everyone so much for coming. It was really a pleasure to have you all. Thank you to Shai and Rafa and Karen and Partners for Progressive Israel. Um, if you'd like to be more involved, we urge you to get in touch with us, please. Uh, we're doing several more calls like this, including on the 23rd, uh, we're doing a call with Suli Khatib and Tuli Flint, two of our activists. And on the 24th, we are doing a call with human rights leaders in the region. Um, you can find more information about that on our website. I'm going to put that in the chat box, um, afcfp.org slash events. Um, it's also up on Facebook. And... Of course, if we'd love for you to participate. Um, if you're unable to participate, we would be really grateful if you could make financial contribution to support our campaign. It makes a very big difference. Um, we need all the help we can from all angles to help support our activists, um, help support our anti-annexation campaign. Um, and we depend on you as our partners and friends to really allow our work to continue. So thank you so, so much for being a part of this. and. Uh, we look forward to see you, Thank see you. you again in the future. Thank you.